So the, the phone uh, rang, and, and I picked it up, and this is when I was in San Diego. I was an outreach pastor at the time, and, and it's my assistant, and she says, hey, Steve, there is a lady that's called, and, and she wants to talk to you, and, she's, and, and, and she kind of sounds distraught, and so I'm, I'm putting her through. And so I pick up the phone, and, and it's a lady, and I had never met this lady, and she had just told me, I was told that I should talk to you. And w- during the conversation, she says, listen, this is my situation. Um, I'm pregnant, and uh, I just talked to someone, and they told me that I should not have this child. And so I just kind of, I talked to someone, and they said, just talk to you. And I just went, Whoa. And so I said, okay, what's, what's happening? Tell me your story. Tell me what's going on. And I remember after hanging up the phone and spending time with this lady, and I remember being, like no other time in my life, having the sober reality of the power of influence and how big that is. And, 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 and you know, I want to encourage and challenge some of us, like, like, like you have people that call you. You have people that come up to you. There's people that are going to ask you questions about the direction for their life. There's going to be people that reach out to you in a place of discouragement, in a place where they're distraught, in a place where they don't know what to do uh, with their life or what to ha- what's going to happen or what needs to happen. And for whatever reason, you're going to find your place in this seat of influence. And, and like I said, it's not like, like, like some of us were like influence chasers maybe, but, but whether you have like tried to avoid it, deny its existence, every single one of us in this room at some place, at some time, is going to be in a position of influence. And the question is, like, 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 like how do you respond to that? Because, because you have people, you have people watching you. People are watching you. People are listening to you. You go like, no, no, they don't, Steve. Yes, yes, they do. And I'll tell you what, if you have kids, you all the time have people watching you and emulating you. As soon as my kid does something, I look at Lindsay and I go, did you teach him that? Like, like, like that's the first question is where did he learn this? He's emulating something that he saw. And so we are influencers. Now, um, this is important because Jesus has designed and called us to be influencers in this world. Like, it's not like a mistake. Like, he has called us, designed us to be influencers in this world. I know I said Matthew 5, but turn with me really quick to John 17. In John 17, uh, verses 15 and 16, and then I'll read uh, verse 18, um, he talks about what he has called and asked us to do. And in John 17, verse 15, it says, I do not ask. Now, it's in red. If it's in red and you're new here, that is Jesus talking. When Jesus talks, we listen. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And in verse 18, it says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So he has just, as as he is in the world and and didn't just go whoop, and, and he has placed us in this world. And when, if you have an understanding, a relationship with Jesus, he didn't after that moment say, okay, you're good, let's go. No, you're still here. In fact, his purpose is for you to be here right now. Because he's, he's called us to be here and to have this influence, this impact on our world. And in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, he talks about how you should smell. You should have this aroma of the gospel. And so we're called to be out here, to be influencers. If we are Jesus followers, we are out here in the world influencing them with the message of who Jesus is. That's a calling. It's, it's part of our lives. Now, why are we called to be influencers in this world? Well, uh, Paul warns uh, in 2 Timothy uh, 3.13 that things are getting worse. We've de- we, you know, it's crazy when you think like we've increased in science, uh, medical, educational, psychological, technological knowledge at an astounding degree. I was just watching this thing on, on, on the advancements that are, that's right now happening in robotics. And I was just like, that is crazy. And, and, and we see that we're doing all these things, but we haven't improved our nature or really our society. Knowledge has improved, but morality has degenerated. Accomplishments have increased, but purpose and meaning have decreased. And those are the conversations that are dominating a lot of our lives is purpose and meaning. It's crazy. It's like we continue to invent 
more ways to corrupt ourselves. <laughs> it's like someone designs or invents something, and it's like amazing, and then, and then all of a sudden we figure out a way to make that bad. Like, it, it blows my mind. Um, now, now, I'm not advocating for this, but I had a friend who met his wife on one of those dating websites. Now, I'm not saying, hey, sign, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not paid by them. Like, like relax. But he did. Now, and I remember it was just kind of coming out, and I remember when, like, like when he, and he was embarrassed to tell me. And I go, really? And I go, what, what was that like? And he's telling me about it, and I go, huh. But I've had other conversations with other people who have gone to websites like that and have used it or been a victim of somebody using that for extreme negative. And so, and so you see that even things that we maybe uh, have designed or, or, or invented to be for good, we somehow turn to bad. And so things in Jesus' day were the same thing. They were declining. They were degrading. And so he turns his focus now in Matthew 5, 13 to influence and the reality that we're called to have influence. And so you need to know right now, you are either bringing influence or you're being influenced. And that's what's going on in our lives. So the Beatitudes are not to be lived out in isolation or only among other Jesus followers, but out in the world. Now, Matthew 5, 13. Let's go back to these. In Matthew 5, 13, he says this. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Okay, so salt historically was something that was looked upon as very valuable. It would bind covenants. It was a form of payment sometimes for, for people in the military. It was, it was important and valuable. And what he is saying as when he communicates, you are the salt of the earth, is you have value. You are important and you have value. The you are stresses the being rather than the doing. He says you are salt, and he's going to talk about light in a minute, but he says salt and light represent what we are. The fact that we belong to Jesus makes us his salt and his light. Now what does salt do? Salt preserves, it creates thirst, it cleanses, it, it gives flavor. And I just want to focus here on, on the preservation aspect, aspect of this but because it says we are the salt. Now, now so we are designed to be salt that prevents the world from degenerating faster than it is. So we, so we, are, we are here, we are called to be salt uh, in a, a world, in a culture that is degenerating, just as salt can be contaminated by minerals and is therefore then useless to taste and lose its saltiness. You and I are called to be salt and, and go against, to preserve the gospel within culture. Now, that's, that's hard, and, 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 but you think about the shift in our mindset if we really, uh, if we really embrace that. You know, I, I have people tell me all the time, like, man, kids these days, like kids, and, and like this, and, and, you know, and I've got two of them. I've got a third on the way. In fact, we just found out it's a boy, and um, yeah, let's pray. <laughs> Man, two is man to man. Three, we're going back to his own. I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening. But uh, we know that we're, another boy's coming. And when people say that to me, though, I go, man, well, I am going to raise some salty boys. And they are going to go out there, and they are going to influence. I don't, I don't go, man, oh, yeah, kids, oh, yeah, ah. No, I am inspired to actually impact culture and to make an influence through how I raise my boys. I want my boys to grow up and to love Jesus and to love other people and to model that and to influence culture. And so when, when, when people are like, man, or like this is going on here, or, or man, the college, and man, you, you go on to that college or, or this college or that, or you talk to that, I'm like, yes, and I love it. I love being in those places because guess what? I am called to be in these places. Like, like I don't, I'm, I'm like not called to be vanilla. I'm called to be salty. 
You're called to be salty. We're called to go into these places and preserve the gospel. And there are people trying to live out the gospel, and they need our help. They need your help, and we need to preserve that. I, I, it's, it's so interesting uh, to me. You know, we, we, he talks about uh, losing, you know, when he says, like, it, it causes the salt to become useless. Jesus isn't talking about you losing your salvation, but, but Christians can lose their effectiveness When sin and worldliness, and when I say sin, it's anything that is in opposition to God or about God. When sin and worldliness contaminate our lives, just as salt can become tasteless when contaminated by other minerals. And what this does to me is this reinforces the value of purity. Of you staying pure and true to Jesus. You know, and, and I think we got to ask, is, is what's happening in my heart, my actions, and the words that come out of my mouth preserving the gospel? Because I know for me to preserve it, it means I need to live it. Like, I have to live it. I have to, I have to talk about it. I have to share my story. Because I, 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 want, you to, I want you to think about it. Like, like, if there is anything of value that you care about preserving, you go out of your way to protect it. You go out of your way to put it in the right environment. You go out of your way to make sure it's everything it can be. Um, Lindsay's, my wife's uncle, who was this big-time collector, and the first time I met him, took me all through his house. And, and I mean, big time collector. And he had all these things. He had secret rooms and stuff full of st- all these things. And, and I remember he's bringing me through all these things and he's telling me what they're worth. So I'm like, okay, robbing you. But uh, I, I just remember going through and him like telling me in detail everything he was doing to preserve these different things that he had collected. And we are in a state of preservation all the time. We try and preserve relationships. We try and preserve marriages. We try and preserve certain things in our house, right? There's certain memories of people that have impacted us or family members that we preserve. You know, some of us, it's our bodies, and we're focused on trying to preserve this. Um, You think about uh, plants. I know Lindsay and I, we just, man, we kill every plant. And so God took us to Eugene, where you don't need to do anything. It just grows. And But when we have, like, a plant, like, like someone a couple weeks ago gave us a tomato. I'm like, you, you know what you're doing? I mean... Goodbye, tomatoes. But, but like, so, so we're, like, we're like figuring out how do we preserve this. You go out of your way because you care about that, and you change things up in order to block this. There are things in your house that if my kids came over and knocked over, you'd be like, honestly? There are other things you would be like, this, no. No, he's two. Get him back. Like, you would be protecting and preserving it. We have to take that mindset and heart, if you follow Jesus, into the gospel. With the gospel. We have to have that mindset. When we are out there, when we, like, this is what I'm preserving. This is what I'm after. This is my focus, is preserving and going against the degenerating uh, culture that we live in. Because we know the gospel can fix that. Or am I contaminated? Maybe to the point of useless. Now, this doesn't mean you don't have meaning or purpose. This means you're losing your effectiveness. There's no positive influence coming out of your life. If I'm talking with you about dealing with anger and trying to help you with that, and then you see me later on the street driving and you see me go into road rage, I have lost my effectiveness or my ability to communicate to you how you should handle your anger. Because you are going to say, hey, Steve, I saw you, and whatever you're selling, I'm not buying because you're not buying it. Okay, so I'm losing my effectiveness by how I am living out my life and what's coming out of my mouth. And so when he's talking about useless, we go through times when we allow our lives to be contaminated by things that have no business contaminating us, and that impacts our ability to have influence, to be effective. And I think that's, that's, that's the heart of this. You can still be a body. You can be a person. The question is, are you effective? I had a friend of mine who, who told me he could fix my car. He came over, and he was there for like seven hours. And then he's like, Steve, I got to go. And I look at my car. I'm like, dude, you could not fix my car. Like, it's a mess. It's worse. And now, and now there's pieces that we don't even know where they go. And, and so now I got to get a tow truck because of what you, you know. And I go, dude, you were useless. I love you. But when it comes to cars, I'm not, I'm not. Don't, don't come back over here for that. 
Okay? So, so you are either communicating something that's effective or I'm modeling, and by what's coming out of my mouth, I'm saying it has no value. My life should value and preserve the gospel. And then in Matthew 5, 14. Matthew 5, 14, it says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So he brings into this, this, this whole light versus darkness. He brings this whole theme into the sermon. And, and, and I'll tell you this, light and darkness is huge in the Bible. It talks about it a lot. And when you think about light and darkness, when you think about how we can see the moon, what is the moon doing? Well, well the moon is reflecting the light of the sun. And so we can see that. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light and there's no darkness in him. So God is light. There's no darkness in him. And then in John 8, 12, Jesus says this. And he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but I will have the light of life. Okay, hold up. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. In other words, now now here's the reality, okay? So light, when we talk about light, we're talking about God, we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about what's right, what's glorifying to him, the gospel. Darkness is the opposition to that, okay? Darkness is is the enemy. It It is evil. It is things that are against the light. And so when we see this, he is saying, I, Jesus is not only light, but he is the source of our light, and we reflect him to the world. And if you follow Jesus, he says you are a light. And, and, and so here's the thing. Many times, just as he said, you follow me and you will not walk in darkness. There are so many times I find that we become so consumed with our mistakes, uh, the things that are happening in our life that are dark, that, that keep happening or they're reoccurring, or you struggle with this. And so you become so fixated on all your struggles that you lose complete sight of what you're following, of who you're following. And many times, that's people that say, I follow Jesus. I'm like, say it again. Now listen to what you just said. Like, like, you got to follow Jesus. He says, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. We are just like Peter on the water going, Jesus, woo-hoo, ah, ah. And we do it all the time because it's not we go, I don't don't want Jesus anymore. It's we become consumed by what is unknown or something that scares us or mistakes that we continually make. And we wonder why we keep making them because we are allowing these things to consume our minds and our lives. And we have totally lost focus of who Jesus is. And if I just follow him, you will be amazed at what he does with some of these things that you can't stop thinking about. And so I want to challenge us with that. And he says in Psalm 1828, he says, he lights my lamp. Oh, I love that. He lights my lamp. You know, uh, I did a wedding about three weeks ago in Yosemite. Yosemite's beautiful. And we had a cabin right outside uh, the park that they put us in with some friends of ours. And, and we were there, and it was nighttime, uh, so it was dark. And we're inside, and there is just this beautiful fireplace. Now, I'm a guy. And as a guy, I'm looking at my buddy, and I'm like, okay, like, we're supposed to start this. Like, we got to light this up. Like, this is a fireplace for fire. Our wives are starting to look at it. It's kind of funny. And we need, to, we need to make this happen, okay? And so now I'm not a Boy Scout. I wasn't a Boy Scout. I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's awesome. Like, I need to go back. But, but I was not that guy. In fact, I called my dad up. I'm like, are you kidding? You didn't even teach me how to make fire? Like, kind of, a, you know, no, I'm kidding. I didn't. Maybe I did text him that. But anyway, so, so we're like, let's, let's, let's do this. And, and so we start, like, I mean, we must have gone through, like, 30 full newspapers. I think they were preserving them for something. We used them. And so we're trying to light this. And short of, like, siphoning gas and dumping it on that, we could not get a lasting flame. It was a struggle. And towards the end, my wife looked at me, and she goes, you know what's going out? And I went, yes, it is. But that's okay. Um, we enjoyed it for 10 minutes, okay? And, 
I think a lot of us become consumed with trying to light our own lights, by trying to figure out how to light our flame. Like, like we read these verses, we're like, I want to be this, and so we're consumed with figuring out all these ways to light us up. And in Psalm 28, or 18, 28, he says, I light you up. I light your lamp. And so when you start following Jesus, he, as a byproduct, he lights you up. You don't have to sit there and go, man, man, I need church because you got to light me up. Um, like, like, worship, you better be good today because I need you to light me up. No, you need Jesus to light you up. You need to follow him. And he says, I will light you up. I will light you up. And then, and then in Psalm 119, 105, this is crazy. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So not only is he going to illuminate you, he's going to illuminate his path for you. He's going to start making that clear. As you follow Jesus in Psalm 119, 130, it says the unfolding of your words gives light. That's why when you come here, we're going to read this. This is what's going to give you light. The unfolding of his words. He wants to illuminate every area of your life. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. When he is the purpose and direction of your life, you are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Whenever I, uh, whenever I fly into Los Angeles, I'm amazed. If I fly in at night, flying at day, you're just like, wow, smog is amazing. But when you fly in at night, it's amazing because it's just dark and very desert. And then all of a sudden, there is just lights, like, everywhere. And sometimes I'll look at that, and, and I'll just think, man, like, you think of these verses, and you think about the reality. If we just said, I want to be illuminated for Jesus, I want to light, I want to be a light. And the power that could happen with that. I mean, it's overwhelming if you fly in there, just the, the, the magnitude of the lights that are coming. And I just think there's so much in us that God has designed and there's so much darkness that is dark just because we haven't really taken this to heart. And he's designed us to be that city on a hill. Jesus' followers do not reflect the world, they influence the world. They are in it but not of it. And then he keeps going in verse 15. And in verse 15, he says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And as you think about that, Ephesians 5, 8, you can flip over there. Ephesians 5, 8 says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord, walk as children of light. You are made, you are designed, you are called to bring light into dark places. God has purposely placed us in dark places that need light. When, when we move um, and, uh, and, and walk through a house, or we, like when we moved here, we wait till the, till the nighttime to identify the current lights that are pre-existing and the new lights that we need to purchase, the lamps that are needed, because we want to see when it's dark, where are the dark spots in the house? And so once we've identified those dark spots, those dark places, we try and find a lamp that will go there to illuminate that area that is dark. And if there is nothing there in that place, it's like Kingston knocked a lamp over. And, uh, and it was like, ah. And then I remember for like a week until we replaced it, it was a dark area in our house. But when, but when you, you think about that, God is going to present opportunities to you or tell you to go to places that are dark because they need light. I know. But think about it, but really, really think about it because, I, you know, it's like, it's like in the morning, I don't open the blinds, especially right now because it's sunny early. I don't open the blinds up and then go, oh, my goodness, and then start turning on lamps. No, it's bright already. I don't need any lamps. Like, like the, the light is already there, and, and, and it's crazy. I think there's a bunch of churches today that, that are full and illuminating, and they're lit, but the rooms they're in already have the lights on. And so that's great. That's great that we're here, that we're excited, that we're lights and, and, and shining in here. But he is calling us into the darkness. 
Like he has created you to be a light, to go find those places, to be in those places where there is no light. I don't use a flashlight with me when I'm hiking during the day. I bring it out at night. We need to bring light into the darkness. Gosh, we need to embrace that today. I just feel like we are so good right now at creating separation. We are so good at looking at something or someone or a situation and, 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 and going, no, 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 I'm not of God. But, okay, I'm not saying that you become that. I'm saying that you bring light there. I was, uh, uh, when I was an outreach pastor in San Diego, I loved it. I was, literally, my mind was consumed daily with how do we bring light into dark places? And it, and it was just amazing what happened. The things that would happen in, in prisons, the thing, the thing that, that we, we, we found out that we had a lady that was just passionate about the deaf community. And, and, and we found out statistics that were staggering to us of how many people that were deaf and how many, how many of them have no idea who God is or have that opportunity uh, uh, through uh, San Diego. And so we're like, let's start something to bring the gospel into that. And I kid you not, we started having a section this big of deaf people at our 10 o'clock gathering. It was amazing. And we started having communities that were meeting um, throughout San Diego County. And, and it was just crazy what God did. I remember when we were like, well, what do we do with homelessness? Well, we're not going to solve it. It's San Diego. If I was homeless, that's where I'd go. We're not going to solve it. Like, like, okay, so what do we do? We love to debate on what would solve these problems. Well, we want to bring light. So you know what we did? We started homeless communities. We started equipping like homeless people to go into communities that I could never go into or I would never have, you know, influence. And, and, and we started homeless communities. And it was crazy what God did through that. We, we were situated in a place where there was like five different strip clubs within a mile of our church. And so what do we do? Do we all leave service and go, ah, ah, ah. Like, like, do we do that? Is that how we really bring light? No. One of the ladies who had a crazy background said, Steve, I feel called. And some of these other ladies, we feel called. And they created these gift baskets with a pink Bible. And they started bringing them to these ladies. Caught in the adult entertainment industry. And it was amazing how God used that to bring light into darkness, into dark places. God is going to call you and ask you and place you in dark places. Not so much that you're like, how do I, how do I, like, like, ah, no, but how do I shine? How do I bring light into this? And I want to I want to just encourage and challenge us because I think we're really good at identifying what's wrong. I'm not asking you to do that. That's pretty easy to do. I'm asking you to to maybe redirect your thought and go, okay. He's calling me to be a light, the example in darkness. So there's darkness everywhere. There might be darkness in your home. How do I bring light into this situation? And when there's a dark place in my house, I don't I don't like lean a flashlight up. <laughs> to like get it, you know, because flashlights, what, they, they focus, they have that little round thing, you know, and, uh, and, and then they flicker and you're like, ah, like, and I think some of us, we're, we're really good when it's just this area, we'll light, we'll, we'll be a light there, but we're not a lamp. And I think for some of us too, we're just like, man, I'm, I like have moments and, and I'm flickering and that's why I come to church, so you'll smack me a little bit like a flashlight because then I feel like I'll put some more out, but no. He's called you and placed you to be a lamp to illuminate an area. And he's going to strategically place you there. Some of our prayers, I think, are backwards where we're like, God, get me out of this. And at some point, you got to ask God, why am I here? Why are they still family? <laughs> why? Why are they my coworker, God? I told you to move them. Let me tell you how that request is going to go. He says, you don't cover the light. Imagine if we climbed up, the, like, uh, we went to Hasita Lighthouse, and uh, it's gorgeous. And imagine if you went to Hasita Lighthouse, and we all go up, and we start boarding off and walling up the glass. You actually see, that doesn't make any sense. Like, it's useless. It's, it's not projecting the light that's 
there. Exactly. We do that in our lives when we allow ourselves to be derailed or to be contaminated by things that are in opposition to who God is. And when we start doing that, when, when, when we start walking down roads that we have no business walking down and, and, and we start allowing things in us that have no business being in us, we start walling up our light. If you are not at all sharing about the hope that lies within you, you are walling up your light. And, and, and you, you just think about it, and you're like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't, because the light, when you experienced it, for those you experienced, you were like a moth. You were just like, oh, my goodness, I need that. I want that. I have to have that. And so, and so if, if there's anything that you need to take away right now, it's like, are you walling that up because God has designed you to illuminate into the darkness? And why in the world would you wall that up when that is the thing? He is the thing. He is the light. Allow him to do what he wants to do. Is your family, your school, your workplace more bright because you're there? What is dark that God has given you a passion for, a calling to? I'm not talking about places that are already light. I'm speaking specifically to, to darkness. What does he place on your heart? What is he calling you to do, to be? And then he keeps, he keeps going here in, in, in verse, 15, or verse 16 in Matthew 5. Verse 16, it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Acts 13, if you'll, if you'll turn there with me, in Acts 13, 47, it says this. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And he's cross-referencing Isaiah 42, 6, where it talks about the coming Savior and talks about being a light to the nations, that how, how, how that, what God is going to do, what he is going to bring, is going to be a light to the nations. And in Acts 26, verses 17 uh, and 18, it says this, it says, Man, Acts 26, 17, unless you need to learn about Agrippa. Acts 26, 17, it says, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those, a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What did it say? So that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. What is the purpose of us shining our lights? Why do we do that? So that they will see your light and want the light. That is why. We are, are, are directional. We are pointing people to Jesus. We are illuminating, not so they go, wow, look at him, look at her. Whoa, they're pretty awesome. They're amazing. No, we want them to look at us, and it should be a clear picture of who God is. It should point to the gospel. And so if, I'm, if, if, if someone is, is looking at your life and, and they're like, man, you're amazing, like, like, like you're missing the point. We want people to look at us and not go, man, they're so great at separating themselves from everyone. No, we want them to look at us and go, I, that, there's something there, there's something about them, and it doesn't make sense, but I want it. When you look at the explosion of the church in Acts, it didn't make sense. And they kept preaching and people were like, how is that coming out of their mouth? They weren't more in love with Peter or John. They were more in love with who God was. To the point of, we just put Jesus on the cross, but now we're going to receive him as our Savior. How does that happen? It happens with us shining so that not they look at us and give us glory, but so they see the glory of God. When you, when you think about someone getting married and, and a bride, now a bride's wedding day, I'm just gonna tell you right now, you don't mess with that, you don't touch that, you don't question it. 
You allow it to be. But it is a full day of schedules to maximize the opportunity for her to look her best in that moment. And there's these, these people, and, and they're all there to help her look the very best she's ever looked for that moment. Now, for dudes, it's like 15 minutes. It's like this. And if you're bald, it's 10. But it is a full day designed for her to look as beautiful as possible. And there's people there that are, like, helping her to look as beautiful as possible for that moment. My job is to make Jesus look as beautiful as possible, as attractive as possible. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about performing. He's talking about attractiveness. My goal is to make Jesus so beautiful, so attractive, that by looking at my life, by looking at me, whenever he has that moment where they see him and experience him for the first time, there is clarity that that is God. And there is clarity and an understanding that that is God because of our lives reflecting who that is. And so it's, it's undiscernible. It's like, man, he's here. He's arrived because I've seen the impact that's happened in all these other people's lives, these lights that are out there, these people that, that I know believe in him. And, and what's happening can only be explained as what they've told me, as what I've seen in their life. And that causes me to want that, the light. I should be consumed today with trying to get you to see and experience God today, not me. Our worship today and the songs that we sing and everything we do should hopefully draw you closer to God and should point a beautiful picture of who God is and should give him glory. So what will we decide today? How is the gospel being preserved through our lives? When you see darkness all around you, in your home, at your work, at your school, on your team, are you illuminating? Are you a lamp in a dark corner? Or are you lighting an area that's maybe already lit? Or maybe, maybe it's flickering. But today, decide to be an, inf in, an influence, in, in, I can't even say it, an influencer. Because if you will embrace that, if you will do that, I'm telling you, people will come and want not you, but him. And just, just like a moth starts like flying like, and just finds its way to that light for whatever reason. If you want an interesting study, study that. And, and they're there and they're, they're attracted to it. And, and we don't know why. Maybe they don't know why, but they do it. And our lives can be that. But sometimes I just feel like, man, I'm just going to be a slug. Like, I'm just going to hang out. And, and some of us, we, we hang out, and we're just like, now, I don't know what the purpose is of slugs. Like, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. But they're, a, they're everywhere here in Eugene. Like, like, slugs are a real thing. Like, the other night, I opened up the door to let the dogs out, and it was like all these slugs just, like, across the ground. It was like a horror movie. I was like, get in here, dogs. Like, get, what's going on? Like, I don't know what value they bring to the world, but... I know that they like the dark, they operate in the dark, and I know that I am called to illuminate the dark, to bring light to it. And I want to encourage you, maybe you're really comfortable in the dark, but you're not illuminating, it's time to light it up. Maybe for some of you that are busy and consumed with how you are lit when you are in an already room that's, that's already lit up, and you're, and you're shining, but you're shining there, and God is like, come on. Come on, I've got darkness that needs your light. And today, that's maybe you. That it's just shifting, like, like your focus and shifting the, 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 these verses from, from, yeah, I'm doing this well, to, to how am I bringing light to darkness? Am I salty? Am I influencing? You are an influencer. You are.